Left. Sound Sleuth Lab. Check. Testing one, two. So here's my little PZM demo. Uh, you got it on the right and the left, and uh, yeah. Got a little towel in the background, and I'm in my uh, master closet here. You know, perfect place to record. So uh, let's uh, get to it. PZM, or pressure zone microphone, started off more as a technique than a product. A microphone is placed capsule side down in close proximity to a flat surface such as a floor or a wall. Rumor has it an engineer dropped a microphone in front of a drum kit and the guy in the booth was amazed at how good it sounded while it was on the floor. Anyway, in 1978, Ken Walhernbrock built a PZM prototype. His prototype had a veneer adjustment and was way over-engineered, even for 1978. Crown launched a mic based on this design and distributed it through Radio Shack. And in 1982, a patent was issued for the idea. So how does this work? Here's the deal. A normal microphone, or even our ears, pick up both direct sound from a source and all the reflections from the floors and the walls. Because the sound travels different distances, there's a possibility, based on the frequency of the sound, that they will either add together and be louder, or cancel each other out and be quieter. As this is frequency dependent, the end result is something called comb filtering. Yep, because the graph looks just like a comb. If the source or the listener moves, the frequency spectrum varies. By placing a microphone very close to a large flat surface, we only pick up the direct sound. This isn't perfect, but it does make a difference. Interestingly, one of the questions I had when going into this was how far should the mic capsule be from the flat surface? Hmm. One of the prototypes I came across used a micrometer mechanism to adjust the distance. Yeah, we're not going to do that. The patent actually answered the question for me. Figure 3 shows a graph of 1 16th, 5 16th, and 9 16th of an inch distance. We want the 1 16th of an inch or less. That gives a flat frequency response to 20 kHz and eliminates any comb filtering below that. For this project, I selected the JLI 61 Alpha, a direct replacement for the Panasonic WM61 Alpha, a now discontinued but legendary capsule in the DIY community. I mounted one to a piece of wood flush with the bottom. Now that we've got the capsule, we need to connect it. This one is similar to the one I used in the Sound Sleuth Instructable because it has a built-in internal FET or field effect transistor. This simplifies things and allows us to either directly wire it to a 3.5mm jack or, with a few extra components, an XLR connector depending on your needs. Let's look at the XLR connection. We're going to use what is called the simple P48 circuit. I had multiple questions on this circuit and how it worked from my last instructable. Are you sure you want to wire the plus terminal of the capsule to pin 3 of the XLR? Isn't that out of phase with a negative connection? Let's review how this works and see what's going on. I learned about this circuit on the mic builder's form. At first glance, it really looks too simple. So what's going on here? Well, the capsule already contains the FET, which has its gate connected to the conductive diaphragm of the actual internal electric capsule. To get the complete circuit, you got to take into account the circuitry inside the mic preamp. The 48 volt phantom power is supplied by two match resistors, and one of those resistors and the resistor from the simple P48 circuit form a voltage divider with the FET inside the mic capsule and provide the correct amount of current to bias the FET. Stripping away all the rest of the components brings us to the bare bones of what's happening. When a positive pressure wave from sound moves the capsule diaphragm, it gets closer to the fixed plate, which has a permanent charge on it. That causes the FET to conduct more. When the FET conducts more, the voltage on the source leg of the FET, which in our case is tied to the bottom of the resistor from the P48 circuit, goes up. The voltage at the drain of the FET, which is the top leg, and is tied to the resistor inside the mic preamp goes down or more negative. The end result is that the internal FET and the two resistors provide two signals that are out of phase and perfect to go into the mic preamp's internal circuitry. I wasn't sure exactly how this looks, so I connected it to an oscilloscope. I hooked that up to pin 2 and pin 3 of the XLR connector, and then played a tone for my phone and set it down in front of the PZM. This is the absolute simplest way to do this. The only downside is that the actual capsule is not tied to ground and floats at around 40 volts DC, and then you gotta insulate it. Alright, onto the 3.5 millimeter connection. Here's the circuit for this. There's a voltage supplied by a resistor to bias the FED, 
and the capacitor couples the AC signal developed into the recorder, camera, or whatever else you have mic plugged into. And those components are actually all internal to the device, so we don't have to supply anything. You may have to go into an internal menu setting and turn on PIP power. All right, we have the electronics complete. Let's build the rest of it. In my pilot build, I built four mics using an angled piece of 3 8 inch thick wood that I made a groove in with a Dremel bit. This worked, but proved difficult to cover the capsule, and it didn't look great aesthetically. So then I settled on using two quarter inch pieces of wood about three inches long. The capsule measures 0.36 inches in diameter, and I used a 15 64 drill bit, which is 0.234 inches. I figured it'd be a nice press fit. I learned that just a little bit of sanding in the hole, or at least the end you'll press the capsule in, is needed. After drilling the hole, I set my drill press up as a router. The Dremel I used first round wasn't quite the right tool, so I ordered an eighth inch router bit. This let me cut a wide enough slot in the wood to contain the wire. After routing the slot, it is time to press in the capsules. The goal here is to have the edge of the capsule flush with the wood. After getting the capsule inserted, I used a pair of needle nose pliers to fully press the capsule in. After inspecting everything, let's glue the top piece of wood to the part with a mic capsule in it. Using wood glue, spread a thin layer on top of the piece. Press the two parts together to seal them in and then clamp them together. Don't worry if there's a little excess glue. Once dry, we're going to sand the whole assembly smooth. Prior to sanding, I used a small piece of paper and electrical tape to cover the capsule for protection. I sanded both sides and the front, first with 120 grit, and then I finished with some 320 grit for final smoothing. For a spacing piece, I used some cardstock, or in my case, a piece of the label from some epoxy. Trim it to size with a razor knife. You're going to need a piece about an inch and a half or so as we only want to use it on half of the bottom of the capsule holder. This is going to give us our gap of less than 1 16th of an inch. With the Lexan we're using, this will provide a nice little gap. Now to the Lexan. The sheet up on an Amazon is 12 inches square. The original PZM microphone is 5 inches square or so, so I cut mine into 6 inch squares by scoring the Lexan and then snapping along the score. Now to glue the capsule holder and the cardboard to the Lexan. Yeah, this won't be super easy. I applied a thin layer of E6000 glue to the cardboard, then pressed it on the capsule holder, smearing it around a little bit. Then I applied a layer of glue to the cardboard in preparation for gluing it to the Lexan. This one requires a smooth, flat surface to clamp to, as the glue will tend to make the pieces slide against each other. After the glue is dried, unclamp the whole assembly. You can now either paint the wood black, or leave it as it is. So, how does about 10 bucks in parts sound? Well, I narrated the whole video using them. As I did this in a couple different takes, you can probably hear a subtle difference in how the mics sound on top of a two-foot square surface. Close miking of narration is not quite their specialty. They're more suited to small ensembles or attaching to a piano lid. I'm working on making that happen. I was able to get them in front of a bass player. I put two on the floor about 10 feet away on either side and then simultaneously recorded them with a pair of TSB 2555B condenser mics I built. Here is that recording. Not bad. Not bad at all. These mics aren't for everything, but they make a great addition to your mic locker. You do have a mic locker, don't you? Well, we will hear these again on Sound Sleuth. And thank you for watching this video. Sound Sleuth Lab.